All right, everybody, we are here today with a really, really special guest I'm super excited about. He is the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Technology Officer for Cepheid. He is a MD, PhD from my institution, UCSF. And we got to work with him before on our flu test video, which was so much fun because it was old school gangster rap and I've been wanting to do that forever. <laughs> everybody, please welcome Dr. Dave Persing. Thank you, Z. It's a pleasure to be here. Man, thank you for being with us. I have been a fan of yours for a long time. That is very yeah. concerning because you're okay. extremely smart, which makes me think <laughs> there's a component of delusion. <laughs> no, yeah, but I, I have this uh, typical pathologist sense of droll humor, and I, uh, I really appreciate what you've done. Now, you, and the thing is, you were there during the kind of early golden age of genetics. Right. And PCR yeah. and tell us a little about that because it's fascinating to me how much this has changed and I think that's really what the show is about is how we've disrupted this technology of genetics made it something that you can do very much more uh, quickly easier less expensive and more accurately than ever before and how that's going to transform care for our patients yeah so I spent the first three years at Mayo figuring out ways to avoid uh, contamination problems and published a lot about how to do that mm. and um, taught you know a lot of people who do PCR now how to avoid contamination in their laboratories um, but along the way because of that publication record um, I kind of became known as the the king of contamination the guy who knew most about contamination and <laughs> as a result of that uh, I get a call in 1994 uh, by Barry Sheck, who is the, what, the criminal defense attorney, the forensic specialist uh, for O.J. Simpson. Well, wait, okay, hold on, hold on. I just want to make sure I confirm something here. Barry Sheck, you who work with Kardashian. Right. So yeah. by being here with you, we shook hands earlier. Yeah. I am one degree of separation from the Kardashians. <laughs> okay. I just want to confirm that. <laughs> so Barry okay. Sheck calls you. Yeah. And it's like the, what, 95? Out of the blue, I get a page and I get oh a call transfer. God. I'm walking down the hall, get a, you know, pick up the, the phone off the hook in the hallway and it's Barry Sheck. <laughs> um, so that led to a series of communications about what contamination is, how it could affect uh, forensic e evaluation using PCR technologies. And, um, you know, whatever you think of the case, uh, the bottom line was there was there were problems with the forensic evidence in that trial that were associated with contamination. And the good news is that the whole field of forensics has changed to allow for better control of contamination problems and really move toward a much more rigorous, stringent process that allows uh, reliability uh, of results using PCR and forensic analysis. So those problems have, have largely been overcome or ameliorated and Johnny Cochran should have said, if the Amplicon fits, <laughs> you must acquit. That's right. That's all I'm saying. Uh, that, that yeah. is, that's amazing. So you've seen and you've participated in the growth and, and, and miniaturization and improvement in PCR over the years yeah. and it's been your passion and your calling. Yep, exactly. So. You know, over the years, the technology's evolved to where, to where it's lo a lot less um, hands-on. It's now self-contained, so uh, contamination is not nearly the problem it used to be. It's still a problem in some settings, but uh, not nearly the, the problem that, um, that we uh, dealt with early on. And it's made it possible to develop and to democratize that technology across a lot more places. But it's, when I, uh, uh, finished my tenure at Mayo, it, it was still something that was the domain of reference laboratories. Mm. Uh, and even now, a lot of molecular testing occurs only in reference laboratories uh, because of the special procedures and skill sets that are required. So um, toward the end of my time at Mayo, I was really feeling the, the, uh, the need to scale, you know, the need to go beyond as much as I loved patient problem solving at Mayo, and I had a lot of the most interesting patients at Mayo that I was consulted on uh, to provide molecular testing, um, uh, I, felt like I felt the need to scale, you know, scale or bail. You know, it was like, 
make this technology more accessible, more available. And um, so there was, uh, and we were just on the edge of being able to um, automate a lot of the procedures uh, that went into the PCR process. Um, so I, when I joined Cepheid in 2005, I, um, I saw this, this cartridge that looked like it would be able to automate a lot of the steps in PCR. And actually, here's the cartridge here uh, that um, we worked on. And essentially, this was taking my four-room PCR facility at the Mayo Clinic with a small army of technicians. And oh, yeah, hold it up high so we can see it. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, yeah. and and using the eleven chamber uh, capability of this technology to be able to automate all the steps of sample extraction, purification, uh, amplification, and detection. Uh, in, in an automated process. Mm. And so that made it possible to think about actually moving this technology out of the reference lab setting and making it much more widely available. So honestly, this is why I wanted you on the show because all the other stuff is very interesting, but it's, uh, it's an archival sort of path to where we are now. Yeah. And with your work, uh, working with Cepheid, You've miniaturized, can you throw that cartridge my way? You've sure. miniaturized what used to take a massive set of rooms and staff at Mayo mm -hmm. into, into this and a machine. Yep. And where this interested me is in the disruption of diagnostics and therapeutics across disease pathways. So right. we're talking about infectious diseases that take currently take too long to diagnose, too long to test for, need right. to go to specialized facilities. We can now do this quickly, cheaply, and accurately in a way that was unimaginable before, which is why we agreed to do the, the flu video right. with you guys, because flu testing, again, the swab, the antigen swab, not so accurate. It may be you know quick, but it's not, if it doesn't give us information that's accurate, it's not helpful. Now yeah. this, quick and accurate, means uh, it's gonna transform my clinical thinking and what I actually do for patients. So you know, is it a ZPAC, is it Tamiflu, yeah. is it watchful waiting? So, so t tell me what, you know, what, what is this technology being used for now through your company that is going to transform how we care for patients? Sure. I think um, I, I, you know, I've said uh, we've gone from trick or treat to test and treat. Uh, and, um, you know, previously you had tests that, that would kind of trick people into thinking they were, they were reliable, but usually they were more reliable for positive results than they were for negative results yeah. uh, because they weren't that sensitive. So they would, if they were positive, yes, they were probably flu or group A strep or TB. Uh, but they, if they were negative, uh, you really couldn't trust that result. Right. Now the results are much more reliable. Mm. Uh, and the negative result, you actually can, te you actually can trust in, uh, in, in, these, um, in these technologies. And so what that has allowed for is a lot greater confidence and the speed to the diagnosis that allows you to make a real-time decision about what to treat with, what to, how to manage a patient. And that's played out on a number of fronts uh, worldwide. 